Hey guys, what's up? It's Jimmy Seleski here with Live from the Studio. And today I came across a clip on YouTube. It was a Breaking Points clip. Breaking Points with Crystal and Sagar. Now, I actually quite enjoy that show from time to time. I find it informative. There are times when I don't find it very helpful. It frustrates me quite a bit as well. So, uh, you know, on any given day, I may source that show for my information or I might source it for my frustration. And today, I found it as a very helpful source of my frustration. Because the clip I watched today was in regards to this hostage rescue mission conducted by Israel in Gaza. Now, before I go any further into that topic, I want to lay out a few things. I am not emotionally invested in either Israel or Palestine. I have said on this show several times, and I don't mean it in a bad way, I don't mean it in a mean way, I don't mean it in a cold way, but if I'm being very honest, the conflict in Israel and Palestine is not something that occupies my brain on a daily basis. It is not something that that genuinely, you know, alters my emotional state or something that I that 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 is a controlling factor. It's not. It's really actually not. And I think that's the case for most people. It's just not socially in vogue to admit so that- that's why I just want to get that out of the way that this is not me being like pro Israel or pro Palestine. I also would like to say that I found both sides to irritate me to no end, pretty much, for different reasons. You know, the Palestine side of the equation, I found annoying because the coverage surrounding them is completely dishonest. It almost just ignores the obvious realities of that situation and tries to paint the entirety of this conflict, uh, as we joked about yesterday on the liberal show, as just another classic struggle of, you know, basically how the left sees things, which is the haves and the haves nots. It's just the communist Marxist way of looking at things. And, And more specifically, in America, it's just white people versus non-white people. That's why you have the term people of color in the first place, right? Because people of color takes in everybody that's not white. It lumps in black people, Latino people, uh, Middle Eastern people, Indian people, Asian people, basically, literally, any group of people on the planet, Native Americans, you name it, any group of people on the planet that isn't white gets lumped into one big group called people of color. It's actually a very racist way of looking at the world because what it implies is, okay, yeah, sure, you're Chinese and you're Japanese and you're Indian and you're from Sudan and you're from uh, Brazil. But at the end of the day, guys, you can say all you want about like how you have this different culture and entirely different experience of the world, different language, different religion, different everything. Um, But at the end of the day, can we all just agree it's really just all you guys are basically just one big group called people of color, and then there's just white people? That's a ridiculous way of looking at the world, but that is the way a lot of quote-unquote racially, you know, open and, and woke people see it. They really do see it in that literal of a black and white fashion. So in the context of the Israel-Palestine conflict, they don't bother bogging the conversation down with the complexities of this conflict. That's way too much work. That's way too many mental hurdles to have to contend with when you have to address the thousands of years of back and forth and the historical context of everything. No, that's boring. And also, it's too hard. And also, it doesn't matter because in my worldview, me being them, it's literally just as simple as the the oppressors and the pressies. And we also have this more specific dynamic of whites versus the non-whites. 
And so in any conflict, you can simply look at it and go, okay, who's the quote unquote white group and who's the quote unquote less white group? Okay. So in this context, you have the Israelis, the Jews, um, they're not quite white, but they're definitely more white than like the Palestinians. So it's very easy from their angle to just go, okay, bang, bang, go, boom, boom. Here's your white group, Israel. Here's your non-white group, the Palestinians. End of conversation. We already know who we're siding with, the, not, the Palestinians, just that simple. Everything Israel is doing is evil and bad and unnecessary and uncalled for. And everything Palestine is doing is just a product of their circumstances. They have no other choice. Uh, they are just complete victims and innocent and just want peace. And that's just, and, and the reason why I don't have to know the ins and outs of this conflict, because as I've said, on the same token, I have become increasingly annoyed over the past months with the people on the pro-Israel side of the equation that have no problem going on record basically saying that any criticism of Israel or the actions it takes is tantamount to anti-Semitism. That is bullshit as well. If I have a problem with an action that the Israeli government takes or uh, the way that Israelis have handled a situation— to just write me off as a Jew hater, I hate that. I literally hate that. I can't stand it. Ben Shapiro, I've said on this show many times, is very guilty of that a lot. And I actually have to take his coverage of this conflict with a grain of salt as well. Because he is obviously very emotionally invested on the Israel side to the point where I'm not necessarily convinced I'm getting objective, neutral coverage of the situation from him alone either. So now that I've laid that out, that the Palestinian side is dishonest. On the other hand of the equation, you have the reality that Israel is very guilty of committing atrocities of their own, of escalating things beyond the point at which most people, including myself, would find necessary of expanding the conflict into Iran, where they bombed the Iranian consulate in um, what country? Syria, I believe it was. We talked about that a while ago. So they have they Israel arguably has used this as an opportunity to exercise a larger scale operation in their own national self interest, which I do not support. However, I do support the idea that Israel is absolutely within their right to not only retaliate to what happened on October 7th, but also to take the necessary military operations to prevent it from happening again. And part of the way, if not the way you prevent it from happening again, is eradicating the source of the problem, which is Hamas. That's plain and simple. And Hamas is deeply embedded in the Palestinian territories where they are supported by a majority of the civilian population there. The entire infrastructure of that, those areas, from all of my understanding of the situation, is that they have tunnels that far exceed any other military uh, infrastructure that's ever been seen in the past. The entire area has been basically converted into a operating ground for Hamas. They are stationing their bases under schools and hospitals purposely, purposely to dissuade and discourage any military attacks on them by basically using civilians as human shields. And that is a real thing. That's like a literal real thing that people choose to ignore. So I want to take the time to discuss the discussion because I've already outed myself as someone who is not hardline one way or the other. I will come clean with you and say that if you force me to say who I would probably side with more than the other, I would pretty easily answer Israel because I believe Israel has the moral high ground at the end of the day. Just because they have the moral high ground does not mean that everything they're doing is right. 
However, it is so incredibly dishonest, in my opinion, to treat Israel and Hamas, the IDF and Hamas, as equal players going about this conflict in an equal way of moral relativism where both sides are just trying to do what's best for themselves and their people and their citizens and both sides are actively doing whatever they can to protect not just their own people but the people on the other side of the fence that that may fall victim to their attacks. It is so blatantly not the case that it almost not even need be said. And that's the problem because it is so obviously not the case that the IDF and Hamas are uh, equal contenders, equally morally in the right, equally justified in their actions. It is so not needing to be said because it's so not true that we just don't say it anymore and therefore people forget that it's not true. And they assume that when you hear all this endless criticism of Israel, it must be because Israel is committing war crimes and atrocities that far exceed and far and 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 dwarf anything that Hamas is doing or is trying to do. And that's a uh, that's an actual problem. And that's why you kind of need to discuss the discussion more so than you needed. I'm not going to sit here and go over death counts and what city this operation was in and how many troops were deployed and the amount of hostages and blah, 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 blah. There are many people on the Internet that will do that. They're going to do it better than me. And if you want to have a detailed account of this specific military operation or any other specific military operation or a detailed, you know, recap of what the current standing ceasefire deal on the table is, this is not the place. This is not a place to discuss the conflict. This is the place to come if you want to discuss the discussion. Because the discussion needs to be discussed. Just like a football game needs a referee, just like the home plate needs an umpire, you cannot have a good faith discussion unless you have people in the conversation that are holding both sides accountable, that are making sure that there is a certain set of ground rules that apply to both of you, that cannot be ignored in the pursuit of one narrative over the other. And so here's the ground rules. Here's the actual ground rules. And here's why I don't even find it necessary to know every detail of everything in this equation. Because one of the things you learn in life, when you stop trying to learn what to think and instead are guided towards how to think, you realize that that pattern recognition is the most effective means of understanding what is happening right in front of you because it can be incredibly taxing on your mind, time consuming and all of the above to go about every situation from a complete blank slate. If every time you got in a new car, you had to relearn how to drive, you had to relearn how to shift gears, you had to relearn how to start the car, you had to relearn how to use the turn signal. That would be an incredibly difficult process. So instead, we have what's called pattern recognition. I have my car. And yes, I drive my car 99% of the time I'm driving a car. However, when I get into a different car, I don't need to re-go to driving school. I don't need to reread the owner's manual of how to operate the clutch and how to use a turn signal and where the windshield wiper fluid comes out of. I don't have to do that because I already understand the concept of a car and how a car works. So at that point, it becomes very easy for me to hop into a new car and pretty much already be 90% of the way there in understanding how this car works. You know, obviously, oh, sometimes, oh, where's the AC button? Oh, it's on this side over here. Oh, the turn signal's a, a, a dial. It's not a knob. That's weird. Okay, so little things like that, the specifics, the specifics, yeah. But you can cut down on a lot of your workload by understanding that 90% of most situations follow a certain formula and only the other 10% 
is specifics that need be addressed and and take up your time understanding rather than taking up 100% of your time trying to understand a situation as if this is something that no one's ever seen before. And the situation in Israel and Palestine is not wholly unlike any other type of conflict or any type of group dynamic between sides. We've seen this narrative play out in our own country, not in the same manner. But when I say that the whole worldview that says whites versus people of color, haves versus have-nots, oppressor versus oppressee, the proletariats versus the uh, uh, bourgeoisie. It's, there's a pattern for a reason, and there's a reason that the narrative follows. There's a reason why in this country, after the George Floyd fallout, the narrative surrounding uh, police brutality was oddly similar to the narrative that seems to apply to every other oppressor, oppressy conflict we've ever addressed in the history of the world. Again, I am not comparing the magnitude of Israel-Palestine to police brutality in the United States. I am comparing the format, and the format is you identify the oppressor class, you identify the oppressed class, and then you apply all the blame, all the criticism, and all of the responsibility to fix the situation to the oppressor class. And you, in turn, abdicate all responsibility, accountability, and blame from the quote-unquote oppressed class. And that's where you wind up in situations where you're defunding the police, not recognizing that police are needed in certain neighborhoods in the city and that a lot of the communities want and need police in those areas to protect them from what's going on, that the entire situation cannot be whittled down to something as simple as cops riding around inner cities, grabbing black people off the street for no reason and throwing them in jail because it's just what they do and that's just how racism works. Acknowledging that there are actually people out there committing crimes. Acknowledging that it's not as simple as literally black and white. And so in the same fashion, when I see all of the mainstream criticism as of late being aimed at Israel and almost none of it aimed at Hamas. It becomes oddly familiar and it makes me think, huh, last time I saw this narrative play out, it was bullshit. And in fact, every time I've ever seen this narrative play out where one side is so obviously being victimized and one side is so obviously victimizing them, that never quite winds up being the case, does it? And so why should I be led to believe that this situation is any different? So until further notice, I'm going to maintain that line of thinking. Now, before I got off on that tangent, which wasn't really a tangent, it was all relative in my defense, but before I went off on that direction, I began by saying that the moral inequivalence between the Israeli Defense Forces, the IDF, and Hamas, the Palestinian military wing terrorist group operating in, in Gaza and so forth, um, there is no equivalence there. There is no equivalence. These are not two equally operational military forces that are conducting their combat with an equal level of concern for civilian casualties and all of the above. They simply are not. Hamas is a terrorist organization. They are not equivalent to a national military Israel is a military governed by an actual government that you may or may not agree with. And yes, while you may say that Israel has conducted 
operations and atro and committed atrocities that are on par with what could be considered acts of terrorism. You cannot say, in my opinion, that that is Israel's actual goal. On the other hand, that is literally Hamas's actual goal. Let's explore the difference in these two sides of the conflict. I'm not one of those October 7th guys because that's also fallen out of vogue to remember that that happened. Remember, for a couple weeks after October 7th when Hamas parachuted into uh, uh, some music festival in Israel, killed 1,200 innocent civilians on purpose, not by accident, not, not like, oh, they were conducting a military operation where they were trying to attack the IDF, the military, and incidentally, 1,200 people were killed, 1,200 civilians. No, no, no. It wasn't an incidental thing. It wasn't an accidental thing. They were targeting their entire stated and, and performed goal was to kill innocent civilians. They then took 200-something people hostage where they were raped and tortured and all the above, and thousands more were injured in that conflict. And that was... What spurred this entire current conflict? That's obviously not the first thing that's ever been done between Israel and Palestine. It goes without saying. But in this most recent saga of events, that was the catalyst, or at least the undebatably biggest straw on the camel's back to spur this current conflict. And again, I feel the need to stress for the fifth time that the deaths of civilians that were incurred in that act taken by Hamas were not accidental. They were not the side effect of a larger targeted military operation. It was the goal. The killing of thousands of civilians, Israeli civilians, and the taking of hostages was the goal. It was the end game. It was not a means to an end. It was the end game. And that is so glaringly, obviously wrong that we stopped even bothering mentioning that it was wrong. And as a result, we forgot how wrong it was in leading to why we're here in the first place. Because all I usually hear is how many Palestinian civilians died as a result of this Israeli military operation or how many of this thing happened when Israel did this. And while I can honestly sit here and say, for sure, you don't want to see civilians, especially women and children, dead, obviously, obviously, ideally, that number, the civilian death count, would be zero. Ideally, that would be the case. Ideally, Hamas wouldn't have parachuted into an Israeli music festival and killed 1,200 people on purpose right off the bat uh, eight months ago. Ideally, that would be the case. And ideally, both factions in this disagreement would never have had a disagreement at all and they'd all live in peace and this wouldn't even be a thing. This is all ideal stuff, guys. That's all ideal But there's a difference between the perfect world and the real world. And I don't claim to be some military general. I don't claim to even be anywhere close to well-versed enough on this subject to discuss what Israel should do or what Palestine should do or how they should have done this or how that shouldn't have happened. I'm not even going to get into that because, again, we're just here to discuss the discussion. And the discussion of the discussion is, dude, anyone who is going to try and sit there and focus 100% of their attention on the incidental deaths as the result of a military 
operation targeted at the enemy faction Hamas and compare that as if it's anywhere close to the purposeful thousands of people dead and hundreds of hostages taken and, and still in holding by Hamas for no other reason. It wasn't incidental in a military operation. It was the whole purpose. Is Israel literally going in and targeting civilian places and just killing civilians for the purpose of killing civilians? No. And the idea, this goes back to the whole other thing with uh, the, the cop police brutality thing and the whole narrative that white cops are out there killing, or not even necessarily white cops anymore because, you know, even a black cop operating in a racist system can be racist against his own black, uh, you know, civilians. That narrative literally does not stand up to scrutiny because if you're being real, the reality is if you're a white cop, in America and you find yourself in a situation where you are in a questionable altercation with a black man that you're arresting or black woman or whatever, with the current political climate over the past few years, what we saw happen to Derek Chauvin, the way we've seen all the people involved in this be dragged over the coals, raked over the coals, become pariahs for this narrative of white police racism against black people and people of color. I would argue, and I would suggest actually, that it's almost obvious that if you're a white cop, you're way more on edge to make sure you do everything by the book when you encounter a black uh, citizen, even more so than a white citizen, because that is sing sitting in the back of your mind, dude, if my, if I do something even questionably fucked up and this body camera footage leaks and I go to court and they put together a freaking show trial like they did for Derek Chauvin, where the evidence wasn't admitted. They completely ignored everything, all the testimony and just, he was guilty because he was guilty because he was guilty. That was it. The trial, much like the Trump thing, was just for show. There was no way Derek Chauvin wasn't going to be found guilty of that because they knew it would have caused too much public unrest. So he's in jail for like decades. And, and, you, and so we've already had examples set of what happens when white police do this. He was the example, the most recent example at least. So to act like the culture in the police department is anything other than morbidly aware of that reality in how they conduct themselves, it doesn't even make any sense. It literally doesn't even make any sense to think it would be anything otherwise, that these cops are anything other than like, damn, I better be on my fucking P's and Q's because I do not want to be the next fucking Chauvin. That's like the actual reality. I guarantee it. Again, I'm not a cop, but I can't imagine it's any other way. Likewise, the more and more people turn their heads to Israel as the sole arbiter of the, all the responsibility and accountability in this conflict, the more I would venture to say that Israel is on their toes about making sure to not give the public and the global community any more reason to hate them or to accuse them of committing a genocide or taking unnecessary steps and whatever else. Even if they were doing that in the beginning, it doesn't even make sense that they would be acting that cavalierly now. It literally doesn't make sense. It would be stupid on every level. So eight months after October 7th, a bunch of failed ceasefire deals later, a bunch of bombed cities later, a bunch of deaths later on both sides, more so on the Palestinian side. Here we are, and Israel conducts a military operation to rescue, I don't know, four hostages uh, that are being held by Palestinian civilians, might I add. And 
they go about it in a way that the the international community is like, well, they they disguise themselves as like federal aid, and then they go in there and and and. and do this rescue operation. And then on the way out, you know, apparently on the way in, it went way smooth, more smoothly than they thought. Uh, and then things kind of went south on the way out and a firefight ensued between them and Hamas, which then led to, uh, a, a, a bunch of hundreds of, of casualties and, and deaths and so forth. And so this has, been the most recent operation in the news calling Israel to task about how they're handling this. And the reason I talked about Crystal and Sagar earlier, the breaking points thing, is because their back and forth was such a clear demonstration of the conversation at large. Because you have Crystal, who's like the more liberal uh, side of things, the kind of hot white chick, and then you have Sagar, who's like the conservative guy. But what I've found that frustrates me about this show is that whenever there's an actual point of debate, like a real point of contention, because I understand that is in part the dynamic of the show. This is a common dynamic on, on political shows like The Hill, for instance, where they have the conservative, usually guy, and the more liberal, usually woman, and they go back and forth, you know, just discussing both perspectives, the conservative perspective on the issue and the liberal perspective on the issue and blah, 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 blah. And they do that on Breaking Points too. And that actually is a decent format for a show. Uh, I think it's actually a little bit more overrated than people like to admit. I think actually what's probably a more effective way of getting both sides of the equation is to listen to the conservative point and then listen to the liberal point, not necessarily on the same show. Just let a conservative voice out his opinion for an extended period of time, undebated, not being interrupted mid-sentence, mid-point, hear them out, and then hear the other side out in the same manner, and then you have a full, uninterrupted, unabridged account of both perspectives. What happens on these back and forth shows is both sides get more into an argumentative uh, debate where a lot of it becomes more emotionally charged and people are interrupting each other and talking over each other and trying to make one-liner points and you wind up getting a lot less out of it than if you just listen to both of them individually. And and this this problem becomes you know, very apparent when you're watching Crystal and Saga because anytime there's an actual point of contention between the two, and I'm going to put this more on Crystal, far more on Crystal. In fact, I'm going to put it in almost entirely on Crystal because what I've noticed is that whenever there's a legitimate point of contention between the two, Crystal winds up dominating 90% of the conversation on some like emotional thought loop. And then Sagar is able to get in like maybe 1.3 sentences at any given time before she stops in mid sentence. And but that's no, no that and then goes back on a back on the same thought loop. It's four hostages, and hundreds of people died. Hundreds of Palestinians died in an effort to rescue these hostages, and that's just inexcusable, unjustifiable. It should never happen. They should, you know, it, it's a violation of war laws or whatever for them to disguise themselves as humanitarian aid only to then try to rescue the hostages and you know acting like the this military operation to rescue the hostages is the only option when they should just take the ceasefire deal and it's just basically her on those four points over and over and over again with Sagar trying desperately to get anything in there edgewise. And I put some of the blame on Sagar too, because he is, you would imagine that he operating under those circumstances for as long as he has, understanding that that is the dynamic that it turns into whenever they get into a legitimate disagreement. He should be better at getting his points out more concisely and impactfully. Sagar seems like the type of guy that is able to get a point across over a paragraph when he doesn't have a paragraph to do so discussing things with Crystal. You have about, like I said, 1.3 sentences, dude. You got to start thinking in tweets because that's the only way you're going to get a point across on this show. If she's on one. 
And the points that he does manage to get out when he speaks, when he's allowed to speak, are not that great. So yeah, I put some responsibility on him too. But again, it's mainly dominated by this thought loop. And I see this not because I just want to sit here and harp on this one show, but this is a microcosm, in my opinion, of the larger conversation as a whole. You have the pro-Palestine leftist progressive wing of the conversation dominating the vast majority of the dialogue in the cases of the Columbia protests literally shutting down conversation blocking classes on college campuses camping out breaking into buildings d- d- you know disruption techniques all the above like a literal physical manifestation of the conversation tactics that Crystal was, I guess I'm going to go out and say unconsciously deploying against Sagar. I think she was just emotional and passionate about that subject, but it had the end result of her really not allowing for a fair good faith conversation between the two. She was so righteously indignant about her view of the discussion that she really just wasn't even willing to hear Sagar out on any level. And that is, again, just a microcosm of the leftist mentality as a whole. They are so emotionally invested in how they feel about something that they actually don't even see the value in a conversation at all. So they shut any conversation down because any conversation that involves the other side voicing their opinions is actually a detrimental conversation. It's actually counterproductive because those opinions need not even be heard. In fact, they shouldn't be heard. They're dangerous and they're wrong and they're evil. Again, I'm not saying that's what Crystal was doing in this particular moment consciously or that she is that type of person, but... That just tends to be the effect when you find yourself overly emotionally invested in a subject. There is some subject, it's the reason why lawyers and judges sometimes recuse themselves from certain cases because they're not able to be impartial. Ben Shapiro is not able to actually be impartial uh, when discussing this conflict because he's overly invested on the Israeli side. A lot of People in the conversation, including Crystal Ball, are not actually able to be impartial and therefore have an honest, good faith, objective discussion of the conflict. When you get into idealisms like, well, you know, we have certain like international laws of how to conduct war and disguising yourself as humanitarian aid is just a violation. That's like, okay, great. So we have a bunch of laws uh, and 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 what things that guidelines that militaries around the world are supposed to follow. But oddly enough, those only seem to apply in this conversation to Israel. Because I would love a list of how many international military laws Hamas has violated since the dawn of this conflict. Does anyone care to a guess? Let's take a guess. How, is there a law that says that you're not allowed to parachute into a music festival and kill thousands of innocent civilians and take many more hostage and rape and torture and murder them and hold them as political pawns to exercise your agenda? There's probably a handful of laws that say that's illegal. Is it a violation of laws to steal all incoming humanitarian aid to the area you're occupying and sell those off to fund your own terrorist organization, build more tunnels, build more weaponry, put your uh, bases purposely underneath schools and hospitals and public buildings like that so it's a literal human shield from your enemy. You're literally hiding behind innocent civilians. It's the most cowardly thing someone can imagine. It's the most evil form of, of war tactics you can imagine. I'm imagining all of those are violations of the quote unquote right way to fight a war. And again, it's all well and gravy to have this idea of a right way to fight a war. But a fair fight is only a fair fight if both sides are fighting fair. 
We had this same conversation about the elections in America all the time. Republicans tend to piss me off. The, the, the more uh, meek Republicans tend to piss me off because they just want to keep on talking about how Republicans can win uh, but based off playing the game fairly and all this stuff. And it's like, you realize we're playing against people that are not playing by the same rules as us. We're trying to win elections against a party that is actively censoring information, that is actively prosecuting their political opponents, that is arguably uh, uh, literally rigging elections. And we're going to sit here and go, I really think there could be a red wave. It's like, dude, if it turns out that the reality of the situation is that you're playing fairly and they're cheating, you're going to lose every time. The same thing when we talk about free trade. Oh, you know, we believe that workers in America should have $15 minimum wage, certain environmental restrictions. You can't just pollute the environment with your factories. You have to abide by certain emissions laws and all these other things. And, you know, workers comp and, and overtime pay and all these other things. Um, but then at the same time, we have free trade agreements with Mexico and other countries around the world where all the factories just move over there where they don't have to abide by any of those rules, produce the products for far cheaper, and then sell it back to us with no tax or tariffs applied. So there's literally no penalty for just taking all their manufacturing overseas, exploiting the people there, exploiting the environment there, and then selling it back with no penalty. So that's not free trade. That's not fair trade. Fair trade is only fair trade if everyone's playing by the same rules. If I'm paying my workers a livable wage to create a product and you're not paying your workers at all, you're, you're basically employing slave labor, that's not two on par equal contenders trying to engage in a price battle. Obviously, you're going to beat me out in the price battle, dude. You're not paying your workers anything. You're dumping your chemical waste directly into the local river. I'm not doing any of that shit, so my operation costs more. Therefore, it costs more for me to produce it. Therefore, my price is higher. So I can't compete. This is not fair trade unless everyone's playing by the same rules. Hamas is not playing by the same rules. And the issue is nobody is even expecting them to. It's literally the bigotry of low expectations at its finest. Hamas is so in the wrong, so evil, so cowardly that people don't even hold them to the same standard. They're playing by two separate rule books. Do you understand this? Crystal Ball is out there. Well, you know, they should just agree to the ceasefire deal if they want the hostages back so bad. I couldn't help but notice you haven't once mentioned the elephant in the room, which is why the fuck are they holding hostages in the first place? That is objectively wrong. That's why we're here. And you're wasting all of your emotion, all of your passion, all of your talking over other people's points on the secondary effect of the situation we're in. You've completely forgotten why we're here in the first place. And I would venture to say that that has a very significant standing in this conversation. I will accept your contention that there should be other options considered for the rescuing of these hostages as long as you acknowledge that there is absolutely no fucking excuse for the fact that Hamas is holding hostages in the first place in the aftermath of a targeted terrorist attack on innocent Israeli civilians and is purposely using their own people as human shields and actually benefiting from the death of their own people whenever Israel does conduct an, a military operation and incidental casualties arise. They are actually propping themselves up off of that in the international propaganda war because every time Palestinians die, Hamas can point the finger at Israel and go, see what they're doing, they're killing our people, and everyone has completely forgotten the fact that, dude, 
You are literally setting yourself up for a situation to maximize the deaths of your own people. That's how evil you fucking are. So you have a terrorist organization in Hamas that is literally committing every single possible atrocity you can imagine, including holding hostages from the aftermath of a terrorist attack that they committed to spur off this whole saga of events in recent history. And then when Israel undergoes a military operation to rescue those hostages, 100% of the criticism falls on them for going about it in a military way as opposed to accepting some sort of ceasefire deal. And that's the thought loop that you're going to hear from Crystal Ball. Take the ceasefire deal. Take the ce What if the ceasefire deal sucks? What if the ceasefire deal does absolutely nothing to help the situation? What if the ceasefire deal grants Hamas what they wanted or way too much of what they wanted and perhaps it's not the best idea to send out a message to the international community that killing thousands of innocent people and holding them hostage and using them as tokens for negotiation is not a viable and acceptable means of getting what you want in a negotiation. Perhaps that's not the best thing. So now Hamas starts the fight, hides behind their own people, and then whenever Israel tries to do anything about it, all eyes are on Israel for doing something about it. Why? Because we have all unconsciously acknowledged that Hamas are such deplorable savages that we can't even expect them to even be held up to any actual level of moral conduct or fair fighting. So the responsibility is entirely on Israel to manage not just their operations, but also work around the fucking savage operations of Hamas. It's Israel's fault when they fuck up, sure. But it's also Israel's fault when Hamas fucks up, which is all the time. So it's just, it's an unfair discussion. And it doesn't help that something like 70 to 80% of the civilians in Gaza and the West Bank or wherever, again, I'm not an expert on this situation. I don't claim to be. I'm just discussing the discussion, just laying out what everyone knows. That is the things that are undebatable. And these things are undebatable. What is undebatable as well is that a large majority of the civilian population in Palestine sees the October 7th events as justified in support of Hamas. So when you have the majority of the civilian population supporting the terrorist regime operating within the confines of their cities, that makes it even harder. That's what leads to actual literal civilians and journalists holding these hostages in their apartments, in their buildings. And I'm not going to come out here and, and, and make a suggestion what they need to do because I don't fucking know. I don't know. Ideally, ideally, the best situation would be for the Palestinian people to recognize Hamas as an occupying terrorist force that is exploiting their lives to advance their own personal agenda. That Hamas is building tunnels and conducting military operations in their territories, purposely using their people, the civilians, as human shields so that they can continue to exercise whatever their goals are with the Israel conflict and for the people of Palestine to say, hey, we're not going to allow you to operate like this in our cities and towns because you are exposing my children, my wife, and all of my people and my family to death and casualties and destruction. But that's not happening. I don't know if that can happen. 
This seems like a conflict that can only be won from the inside out. Israel is constantly going to have to be tiptoeing around this, that, and the third to try to, you know, surgically remove Hamas from Palestine. And it's never going to work because for every one terrorist that they kill, they're going to radicalize three more, 10 more, as the old saying goes. And that's true. So this is a, this is like the Greek myth where you cut off the head of the dragon and it grows two more the Hydra or whatever. So Israel is doomed to conducting that operation. And again, there is no sentiment, as far as I'm aware, within Palestine that Hamas needs to be eradicated, that civilians are banding together to get rid of Hamas. And I believe a large part of that is because they all view Israel as a common enemy and most of them view Hamas as an ally or representative of them. So how the hell do you contend with that if you're Israel? But once again, this narrative, this pattern that we noticed is, is just all too present in every one of these conversations. That oppressor oppressy narrative. None of the responsibility is ever going to fall on the people of Palestine who are not Hamas to aid in the removal of Hamas. It almost seems like my toes are curling even saying that, mentioning that as a possibility. Do you think maybe there should be some discussion over whether or not the innocent civilians, the non-terrorists in Palestine should be working with Israel to eradicate the terrorists that are operating in their own city walls that are building their bases under hospitals and, and school buildings and everything else? Well, you would think that. The problem is that most of the people in Palestine don't see it that way. And so they're not going to work with Israel. They hate Israel. That doesn't mean that they should be killed or that it's a good thing when they are incident when there are casualties of civilians. None of that is what I'm saying. I'm saying that this is an incredibly complex situation where it is not as black and white as Israel is just committing a genocide and the Palestinians just want peace. That's all they've ever wanted. They just want peace, guys. Hamas just wants peace. No, they don't. But we're never going to get to that part of the conversation. Because we're sitting here arguing over balls and strikes at the plate with no umpire. There's no real umpire in this conversation. But if there was, that umpire, without needing to know any other things about the situation, would be able to look at it and go, hey, clearly we are dealing with a very lopsided conflict, not just in military strength, but in moral code, uh, how they're going about operations, their amount of concern for civilian casualties, their worldview. Every, this is not an equal playing field. So when I hear people like Crystal Ball get on there, and I understand the, the reverse of this argument, the conservatives that are just you know, sitting there, look, uh, you know, one death is a tragedy, a thousand deaths is a, st is a statistic. That, why is that so hard to say? Some of these quotes are hard to say. Stalin said that. I wonder if he also stumbled over his words, or maybe it's easier to say in Russian. Regardless, one death is a tragedy, a thousand deaths is a statistic. Meaning that, you know, when you talk about war casualties after a certain amount of time, you just, it just becomes a number. You stop seeing it as individual human lives being lost or destroyed. And so the criticism coming at the pro-Israel, you know, quote unquote, right wing uh, perspective is, you know, how can you sit here and try to have this like objective, analytical discussion about 40,000 Palestinians, civilians that have died 
since this conflict has been ongoing. And it's like, yeah, you have to like not just see that as a number, four zero 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 zero. Like those are 40,000 people, human beings. And that's why I'm not over here saying Israel is 100% in the right. On the same token, however, this line of thinking coming from the left to the pro-Palestine side of things, where it is Israel's job and Israel's job alone to make sure that people are safe in this conflict, none of that responsibility falls on Hamas. None of that responsibility falls on the people of Palestine that are aiding and supporting Hamas. And Hamas is allowed to commit targeted acts of terrorism against innocent civilians and hold people hostage and refuse to give those hostages up until Israel bends to their demands. And Hamas is able to do all of that with no criticism because what do you expect? It's just Hamas. Why should we expect that they conduct themselves like civilized human beings? No, they get to do whatever they want. And then it's Israel's job to walk on eggshells and tiptoe around every possible thing. And, 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 you know, if they make any missteps or anything goes wrong, like this operation yesterday where they almost got out or, or, well, we didn't like, we, you know, we didn't like that you disguise yourself as humanitarian aid. That's against it. It's like, you know what, dude, we didn't like that they have four innocent people held hostage for the past 240 days. We didn't like that either. And it's just amazing that you're focused on the fact that we put on a certain costume in order to sneak by their security. And not at all concerned with the fact that the reason we put on that costume disguise to sneak past their security was to get Innocent people that have been held hostage since October that they are refusing to release that are being held by civilians who are aiding Hamas. And you have nothing to say about that. Me disguising myself as, as a humanitarian aid is a war crime. Them holding hostages that we're trying to rescue is not a war crime. It, we don't even, who cares? And that's really the, 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 the moral of this whole discussion is that sometimes things become so obvious that you stop seeing them. You become nose blind to them. They become such a part of your reality that you forget they're a part of your reality. We have become so used to the idea that Hamas is operating in a completely unacceptable, completely inhumane, completely unjustifiable manner that it's just become a given. And now we've diverted all of our attention to scrutinizing every move that Israel makes and completely ignored Hamas entirely because it's just a given that they suck it's just a given that they're evil. It's just a given that they want to kill Israeli civilians and don't give a flying fuck about Palestinian civilians as well. It's just a given. So we don't even talk about it and therefore we forget about it. And that's the problem. So let's not forget what's going on here. I don't know shit about the ceasefire deal. I don't know shit about Rafa and all this other stuff. I told you at the beginning of this episode, this is not the place for that. What I do know is the conversation that's being had on a large scale right now is dishonest and, 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 and ignorant, willfully ignorant to the obvious realities of the situation. And that's why it's important to discuss the discussion. Live from the studio, folks, my name is Jimmy Seleski. New content on this channel every Monday through Friday. Hit the subscribe button. Leave us a like. Leave us a comment. Tell us what you think. Till next time, peace.